in the latter part of the 20th century, it would be included in another network of sites. A romantic nationalism that appealed to archaic origins significantly informed the cultural policies of the Pahlavi dynasty. They were the last dynasty to rule Iran before the Islamic Revolution in 1979. This was particularly evident in the reign of the last Shah, dating between 1942 and 1979. The public manifestation of this policy was the celebrations of the 2500th anniversary of Persian kingship. Avoiding the details, the celebrations were intended as a show of glamour and power to other nation-states, authenticating Iran as a modern state with ancient origins. It would seem that to prepare the site, a further spatial intervention was carried out by the Italian Institute for the Middle and Far East Ismail. They dismantled the Islamic period structures in order to restore the Achaemenid palaces, and this would provoke a desire to restore the Islamic layer almost 40 years later under the Islamic Republic. On 12th of October 1971, the Shah inaugurated the celebrations in Pasargade. In a formal procession towards the tomb, which now looked pristine, he laid a wreath upon Cyrus's tomb and addressed him, thus positioning himself as the legitimate heir to the Achaemenids. Combined with that speech, which constituted a textual reference, the performative action, actions on Pasargare and the other Achaemenid site, Persepolis, transposed Pasargare and colligated it into state ideology. The celebrations became contentious when the political opposition used them to reject the legitimacy of the monarchy and with it the ancient tradition of kingship and the pre-Islamic culture and monuments as its alibis. The triumph of the Islamic Revolution reinforced that rejection. The Islamist state asserted that the Pahlavis glamorized pre-Islamic Iran in order to reject the nation's Islamic identity. This was, of course, another false ideological statement. Instead, the Islamic state advocated a reconstruction of collective identity by ascribing due prominence to religious aspects of daily life and culture. This revisionist attitude was manifest in relation to cultural heritage and monuments, which now had to fit the new sanctioned narrative of authenticity or be committed to oblivion. The elimination of representations and citations of such monuments and their related citations in history and popular culture, which amounted to a rewriting of history, the official control over language and discourse, and the dwindling attention given to Pasagare and similar sites were practical attempts short of destruction to reinscribe sites as alibis for false and usurper monarchies of the past millennia. However, cultural memories are hard to obliterate and so is the idea of place, which carries residues of traditional practices as a polemicist. The next major controversy would be over development projects which would change the imagination of the place by transforming the landscape. In 2003-04, concurrent with the registration of the site as World Heritage, another controversy erupted, this time over the construction of the Sivan Dam in less than 20 kilometers southwest of Pasargade. The details of this controversial development, probably proposed in the 1950s by American experts as part of the Point 4 pl development plan, fall beyond this paper. Suffice it to note that it caused public uproar, national and international protests and lawsuits. This became an occasion for politically colligating Pasargade and a quote bloated attempt to settle a grudge with the current government of Iran end of quote as monarchologist observes. The controversy was fueled by a mixture of misunderstanding, disinformation, sensationalism and fact. It was spearheaded by overseas heritage enthusiasts come political opposition who set up the Save Pasargade website and petition and domestic heritage societies. Pasargade was thus inscribed through the many political references, textual citations and historical invocations as a place in which Islamism contended with its opposition forces of different colors. Today, factions within the state seek to authenticate themselves with reference to Cyrus and Achaemenid sites, including Pasargade, once again politically colligating pre-Islamic heritage and monuments. 
President Ahmadinejad and his allies hinted at espousing an Iranian school, presumably a nationalist Islamist state ideology. His deputy, Bagai, referred to him as the Cyrus of our times. His statements were rebuked by factions within the Islamic Consultative Assembly as false proclamations and attempts in restoring falsehood, which was an official derogatory religious term reserved for the Pahlavis, the previous monarchy, ironically invoking memories of the celebrations and to mark the Iranian New Year, which is the 21st of March, Ahmadinejad planned to invite delegates from a number of countries to another Achaemenid site, site of Persepolis. Such moves attracted fierce criticism by conservative factions who considered them a threat to the revolution and the unity of Muslims. Just a few years ago, popular celebrations of the Iranian New Year in Pasargade and other instances of inscribing the place by groups of people turned violent. And later in 2009, domestic tourists protested against Ahmadinejad's election to the presidential office on that very site. In a televised interview, Ahmadinejad, the current president of Iran, praised Cyrus as a great ruler and king. My account of the transpositions of Pasargada shows the relevance of an idea of place predicated upon the dynamics of collective imagination to understanding the site and by extension to establishing a museum. As a next step, it is useful to schematize the collectives who imagine Pasargada in their own ways. For this, I will rely on an idiosyncratic version of defining the term collective. Accordingly, collectives are bounded group formations of human actors assembled for specific purpose and length of time. As such, collectives have their own identity and duration, and they can and often do overlap. The same actors may appear in more than one collective concurrently. The identity of collectives, like any other identity, is relational. Therefore, it would be problematic and possibly misleading to designate collectives a priori. Nevertheless, my account of Pasargade suggests some candidates for collective actors, such as state actors. Beyond that, I can only offer a provisional set of collective actors, which have to be confirmed, analyzed and understood anthropologically through close observation on site. As a working device, I designate state and non-state actors as the two broad but overlapping collectives. In the past century, the two state actors have been the Pahlavi monarchical regime and the Islamic Republic. As my account suggested, even within each collective group, it is possible to identify a number of shifting attitudes towards the site and the subsequent place that it that is created. The role of these actors and their particular interpretations of cultural and heritage policies beyond the stated generalities is far from clear and requires further research. It isn't exactly clear how these actors have influenced other group formations and to what extent the latter is driven by discourses beyond the geopolitical boundaries of the nation-state, or by global discourses including UNESCO's cultural heritage discourse. However, it is clear that increasingly state and non-state actors are competing over the inscription of heritage sites such as Pasargade. Non-state actors consist of group formations with or without an overt political agenda with regard to national, cultural and ethnic identities. Five groups of non-state actors are tourists, residents of nearby villages, nomads passing through Pasargade, non-governmental heritage societies in Iran and abroad, contesting political groups such as those promoting ethnic nationalism and separatism. With the help of social media, some of these groups can exercise a growing influence in the making and dissemination of the image of pre-Islamic heritage and through it, contemporary Iranian identity. However, there is little research on the attitudes of heritage societies towards Pasargade except for general, often political pronouncements for or against pre-Islamic heritage by contending political groups. I will only elaborate on two of the above that are more vocal in contestations of Pasargade and the Achaemenid heritage in general. 
They are non-governmental heritage societies and political, politically activist groups such as separatists. Iran. These societies are relatively recent and have been established since the early to mid-1990s in accordance with the Islamic Republic's constitution. They appear to be apolitical, purely concerned with promotion of Persian heritage and culture, part of which is concerned with the preservation of monuments. Nevertheless, their cultural activities have political consequences as evidenced in protest against official decisions and at times clashes on sites including Pasargare. There are a number of cultural heritage organizations outside Iran, such as the International Committee to Save the Archaeological Sites of Pasargad, which proclaims to reflect, and I quote, only national humanistic aspirations of its members in an attempt to save the archaeological sites of Pasargad, end of quote. Whilst at the same time it remains independent of political parties, organizations, or groups. Despite this proclamation, this organization ran an international campaign against government programs for the construction of Sivan Dam near Pasargade, a campaign underpinned by nationalist sentiments and reacting to the Iranian state Islamism. Despite these apparent exchanges, reactions and attempts at co-option, the impact of these groups and organizations upon the growing interest in Achaemenid monuments is not studied. To what extent, one should ask, do they form de facto opposition rather than heritage groups? What is the role of a place such as Pasargada in subverting state cultural agenda? What is the group dynamics between them and other actors? How is an official response furnished in relation to Pasargade? Answering such questions will provide a clearer idea of the shifting collective imaginations of Pasargade. Pasargade and the Achaemenids are dismissed by separatist groups in particular. In their narrative, the Achaemenids were invading oppressors who attempted to annihilate and oppress the indigenous population of the Iranian plateau. To this group, pre-Islamic history is but an invention by contemporary oppressors who, depending on their political persuasion, may range from Jews or Zionists to a mixture of the two with imperialist colonialist intentions. This group, too, fights present ideological battles through ancient relics. To them, Iran, which for centuries has been a multi-ethnic and multicultural place, is constructed through the oppressive force of a single ethnicity which they fabricate. That is the Fars ethnicity or the Persian. They consider the Achaemenids as the fountainhead of the Fars atrocities, which were in modern times expressed through the establishment of the nation-state and particularly with the designation of modern Persian as the national language. Their ultimate goal is to establish a separate nation for different ethnicities and quote-unquote emancipate those nations from farce chauvinism and Persian fascism. This ultimately intends the disintegration of the geopolitical entity of Iran. The practical repercussions of the attitudes of this group toward Pasargade are unknown. More importantly, the interactions of this group or any other group nominated here with the local residents of Pasargade, as far as published evidence is concerned, remains a mystery. Understanding the formation of these different groups of actors and their grand narratives clarifies different conceptions of Pasargade and possibilities of their assemblage in a lasting inclusive museum. Pasargade is a microcosm, indeed a metonym for the current situation of Iran. The socio-political tensions and possible disintegration of the site cannot be averted by a museum. However, a considered approach to the establishing of the museum can mitigate the situation by assembling otherwise disparate collective imaginations and including them within the umbrella of a multiple place. I have suggested the role of different collective actors in constructing and disseminating contending ideas of place. I have identified possible collective actors that can and do inscribe Pasargada as place. Here, Place is the network, to borrow a Laturian term, that brings different actors and their representations together. Establishing a site museum through this process is time-consuming. In the immediate term, however, it is perhaps most appropriate to take measures that diffuse the tensions surrounding this site, and this too is possible with reference to the idea of place, which, as mentioned, involves an indispensable aesthetic experience. Here, aesthetic designates a kind of sensitive knowledge, Aesthetic thus includes what may be termed as poetics, which my colleague Jennifer Harris discusses as a possible approach to establishing a museum in Pasargade.